So I'm Dave Lederer. I'm a pulmonologist uh, in New York and a senior medical advisor for the Pulmonary Fibrosis Foundation. Thanks everyone for joining us. We're going to talk about non-genetic causes of pulmonary fibrosis. Um, a quick disclaimer um, that this is all medical information and, and should not be, uh, uh, anything I say should not be, um, should, it, should not influence your own medical care until you talk to your doctor about it, so please don't make any changes to what you're doing. I want to introduce um, the, the talk by really beginning with some, some terminology, because I know that this terminology can be confusing. Uh, so uh, we use different abbreviations in, in this world or this disease state, including ILD and PF and IPF. So ILD stands for interstitial lung disease which is a family of over 100 different interstitial diseases that all affect, cause inflammation or scarring in the lungs. And the, these, this inflammation and scarring, or fibrosis as we call it, occurs in the walls of the air sacs. And then any type of interstitial lung disease that has scarring, we may also refer to, to as pulmonary fibrosis. So there are many types of ILD, and many of those are also called pulmonary fibrosis. So both of those terms refer to many different diseases that are similar. You'll also hear the word idiopathic, which means of unknown cause. And then you'll also hear a term idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, or IPF, that I know many of you are familiar with. And I just want to be clear that IPF is just one of many types of pulmonary fibrosis of unknown cause. So you'll see that I've used the, the word cause a lot here, um, and I'm um, oh, sorry, these are some unknown cause uh, 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 diseases, including IPF, but all of these others here are also of unknown cause, including idiopathic nonspecific interstitial pneumonia, cryptogenic organizing pneumonia, sarcoidosis, and, and many, many others. Um, and, and again, I'm using the word cause because that's what I'm talking about today. I'm going to talk about the causes of scarring. Why does this happen at all? Um, in, in, in uh, why, why does pulmonary fibrosis happen? And we've titled this talk Non-Genetic Causes of Pulmonary Fibrosis, um, but that kind of begs the question, what about the genetic causes? So I do, uh, do want to mention the genetic causes very briefly before I go into the non-genetic causes. Now, every disease, pretty much every disease, or most diseases, um, have both genetic and non-genetic causes. Um, it's hard to find any disease where there's not even a little bit of predisposition because of genetic differences between people. So we, we kind of see three different uh, categories of pulmonary fibrosis in which your genetic makeup or your DNA can contribute. So a small percentage of the time, pulmonary fibrosis can quote unquote run in the family. That is that there's two people or three people or sometimes even more in the family, often in the extended family, who have had or have a form of pulmonary fibrosis. Um, and, and in those settings, there's clearly a gene that's, that's uh, being transmitted uh, and contributing to the disease. Um, but it's not like there's one gene that we know about that causes all of pulmonary fibrosis. There are many different genes. Sometimes we can identify them and sometimes we can't. And often when it does run in the family, we might get a genetic specialist involved who could help us identify whether there's a specific gene involved or not. But even if you're the only person in your family with pulmonary fibrosis, it turns out the genes are still involved. Again, that's true for any disease. It's true for high blood pressure, high cholesterol, for heart disease. Um, so it's not surprising that genes will contribute to pulmonary fibrosis. Uh, I'll, I'll illustrate the problem we run into in the clinical setting, that is with a doctor and a patient in the room discussing this, it, are genes helpful? Is it helpful to test for g genetic changes or do genetic testing when someone has pulmonary fibrosis? Well, here's an example. There's a gene, and all genes have funny names. This one's called MUC5B. It's on the screen there, and doctors will refer to it as MUC5B. Uh, and we all have the gene. I mean, this is a gene everyone has. And uh, about 30 to 40 percent of people with IPF, idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, will have um, a variant or a change in this gene that seems to contribute to scarring in the lungs. Uh, 
but it turns out that 10% of healthy people also have this abnormal form of the gene. So even if, for example, we did testing, we sent your DNA to the lab to see if you had this abnormal MOC5B gene, you know, it, it may not be that helpful in telling us how to treat your disease, how to diagnose your disease. Even if we tested your family members, 10% of them would also test positive and probably never develop the disease. And in fact, there is no widely available test for this specific gene, just point out. So there's a lot more in there. This is not a talk uh, webinar about genetics. Um, we do have one archived on the PFF website that you can listen to. It's really a fantastic webinar. And we'll probably hold another one in the next year or so since it's such an important topic. And I'll finally, regarding genetics, mention that there are very specific types of pulmonary fibrosis that are usually rare diseases that can be caused by one abnormality in a gene. And just a couple examples would be hermansky pudlock syndrome and dyskeratosis congenita, and there are many others. And I know you probably don't know what those are, but um, for those who have them, they are important diseases that, that um, do have a genetic cause. So when we talk about a non-genetic cause, what, what do I mean by that? Well, um, I, I mean it's any cause of your disease that's not due to the genes that you carry. And you can imagine in the whole universe of all the diseases that doctors have encountered, there are lots of different causes of disease, and you know many of these. So there are diseases that are due to infection, due to trauma, uh, diet. We know diet's a big factor in health. Uh, stress itself and all the different varieties of stress contribute to disease. Uh, if you're not getting enough sleep, believe it or not, that can contribute to certain diseases, physical activity, smoking, and many, many other things that some of which you're familiar with and some that you'll see on, on the next few slides you may not be familiar with. So let me move to the next slide. So an important question now is are these non-genetic causes important in pulmonary fibrosis? And this is the broad family of pulmonary fibrosis? And the answer is yes, it's a big yes. Uh, and part of the reason these causes are important is that if we can find a cause of your pulmonary fibrosis, we may be able to target that in some fashion, as I'll show you, and that could potentially help you. In addition, if we can identify these causes and, and hopefully through additional research, identify new causes that we don't even know about, that I'll, I'll get to at the end of the talk, um, Potentially, we could implement public health efforts that could even prevent pulmonary fibrosis in people who are at risk. Again, I'll come back to that at the end of the, the talk to explain that a little bit. So this is the outline of the talk I'm going to give you, the webinar today. Um, the first part, which is really pretty much everything I'm going to talk about, is talking about pulmonary fibrosis when we, can, when we know the cause, and in this case, a non-genetic cause. And then at the very end of the webinar, I'll talk about what we think of as quote unquote risk factors, what that word means and how it applies even to idiopathic forms of pulmonary fibrosis. So here in part one, I'm gonna talk about four categories of pulmonary fibrosis um, that uh, are, some of which are very common, uh, at least in my clinical practice. And these are, and I'll define these, chronic hypersensitivity pneumonitis, connective tissue disease related interstitial lung disease, occupational lung diseases, which doctors often call pneumoconioses, and I apologize for that term, but it'll come back to us in a few, few slides, and then pulmonary fibrosis due to medications or radiation therapy. So I'm gonna spend a while now talking about each one of these uh, to illustrate the disease, uh, what we know about it, and what you potentially could do about it with your doctor. And I'll start with chronic hypersensitivity pneumonitis. So folks will often abbreviate this disease as HP or CHP. <clears throat> the chronic part of this implies that scar tissue is present because we can see other types of hypersensitivity pneumonitis that don't have scar tissue, and therefore we wouldn't necessarily call chronic. Um, the terminology among doctors is a little confusing and people use terms in different ways, but that's the fundamental issue behind the word chronic in chronic hypersensitivity pneumonitis. Now this is an interstitial lung disease caused by exposure to things in the environment, and usually we mean 
airborne exposures. And the most common causes of this disease, at least where I work in northeastern part of the United States and, and I believe around the country and probably around the world, the most common cause is airborne mold. And that comes from sources of mold, usually in this case in the home, although sometimes it can be in the workplace or some other location that someone spends a lot of time, like a summer home or a you know, vacation condominium or something like that. Um, another cause is bird exposure, and I, some people raise their eyebrows when I say that. But bird exposure, and we're really talking about either indoor birds or caged birds, um, like pigeons, uh, are, are the major concern. And we've also learned over the past few years that down bedding and feather products may also be risk factors or be causes of hypersensitivity pneumonitis. The long-term exposure to mold or birds or some bacteria in the home can lead to this inflammation and scarring in the lungs that we call chronic hypersensitivity pneumonitis. Here we go. So clues that your doctor might use to identify whether or not your pulmonary fibrosis is hypersensitivity pneumonitis would be to ask you questions about whether there are areas of your home that are damp uh, or have visible mold, is there water damage in your home uh, or workplace. Uh, we ask about whether or not there's standing water in your home and those can be things as simple as a humidifier or a hot tub or other uh, kind of standing water that could get contaminated by mold or even certain forms of bacteria. Um, so this is something in my practice when I'm talking to a patient I've met for the first time that I spend a good deal of time uh, talking about. I'll ask them how long they've lived in their home um, and again whether there's any source of, uh, of water or mold in that home. We also ask about birds as I mentioned and down bedding and feather pillows. So those can be clues and then um, there can be, uh, and often are, very specific findings that we'll see on a CAT scan or, if needed, a biopsy of the lung when we look at the lung tissue under a microscope. So there, and sometimes we don't need a biopsy, but these are the clues that I use in my practice and I, I think most pulmonologists use in their practice to see if HP might be the type of pulmonary fibrosis that, that you have. Um, <clears throat> so some common questions that I would anticipate and, and I do here are the following. So the first is, I have mold in my home and I have hypersensitivity pneumonitis. Are my, is my spouse or my kids, uh, are they going to get this disease? Well, I think there's a lot of mold in the world. There's a lot of mold in people's homes. Uh, and I'm not really talking about, you know, a little bit of mold in the bathroom. I, I think that's, that's pretty common and benign. Um, but most people who are exposed to mold of some kind will never get sick from it. Uh, of course, there are people who are allergic to mold, so will get allergies or asthma, and that's very, very common. Um, and if someone has a weak immune system because of a disease or medication they're taking, mold can be life-threatening. I mean, mold, people can get very serious fungal infections. Um, but it turns out only a small percentage of people who are exposed to mold will develop pulmonary fibrosis. That's a, no one knows the, the number, the percentage, but it is a small percentage. And I will say I have seen at least one family where both people had hypersensitivity pneumonitis from, uh, from exposures that they shared. Um, but almost, every, and I see a lot of this disease, but almost everyone I've seen with this disease they're the only one in that home who ever developed it. And why they got it and someone else didn't get it is unknown. Probably part of it has to do with genetics, as I mentioned earlier, but there probably also means that HP is not just due to one thing. You know, it's, it's exposure to mold plus maybe something else. Maybe it has to do with smoking or diet or things we haven't discovered yet. So that's question one. Question two is how do I even know if I have mold in my home? Uh, and that's, you know, if you can't see it or smell it, the truth is it can still be there. Uh, and the first step is talking to your doctor and saying, you know, is, do I need to be worried about mold? Do I have hypersensitivity pneumonitis? Um, and uh, how do I find out uh, if there is mold 
And the answer is that a home inspection company or an industrial hygienist can do a home inspection. There's, there's not a lot of um, science behind it. There's, there's different ways to check for mold. Most of the time, this would include taking air samples from different parts of the home, taking air samples from outdoors. The, you know, outdoors would be kind of the normal level. So if there's a normal level outside and a really high level in the basement or the bedroom, that would, that would be a clue. Um, and of course, a visual inspection, um, looking uh, throughout the home, especially in the basement uh, or first floor, which can obviously have flooding at times, and also any ventilation systems. Uh, very important to look at the ventilation systems. Uh, sometimes homes with uh, ventilation systems that are heated, so forced hot air systems, uh, especially if they're humidified, could, could develop mold. And so if you do have mold, should you get rid of it? That's a complicated question and it depends on your specific health circumstances and I, I recommend that you talk to your doctor to see if getting rid of mold is the right thing for you to do. Um, I do have many patients where I do recommend they get rid of mold uh, and I have other patients where I, I, I don't make that recommendation. So really important question is how do we treat this condition? How do we treat it? Well, there is no one right answer. Um, you know, I, I try to tailor my management strategy and disease treatment to each patient because everyone has such a unique experience with the disease, whether that's, um, you know, how it presents, how they live with it, how they experience it, what their risk factors are. Um, but there's a widespread agreement that if you have HP and if we're able to identify a cause of it in your environment, um, getting rid of that exposure or removing you from the exposure could have a potential health benefit. So that, again, is very important for you to talk to your doctor about. Um, there is a role uh, for using immunosuppressive medications, uh, and there are many of these. Examples would include prednisone, uh, mycophenolate, which is the brand name Celsept or Myfortic, and another drug, which is azathioprine. The brand name is Imuran. Uh, they're not right for everyone, uh, but they are right for some people. And again, there's no one right way to do it. Some doctors prefer one type of medicine or combinations of medicine. And I have people that I use one or more of these on and other patients where I say, you know what, let's hold off. And maybe the risk of medication is bigger than the potential benefit. And then lung transplantation can also be a treatment for hypersensitivity pneumonitis. Again, particularly chronic hypersensitivity pneumonitis uh, in which scar tissue is present. Um, and uh, if you do have HP uh, or any form of PF, you, you sh certainly should talk to your doctor about whether lung transplantation might be something you should consider. And then another question I get all the time is what about the current FDA approved drugs? What about profanidone? And the brand name for that is Espriot. And what about nintetinib? And the brand name for that is OFEV. So these drugs currently are FDA approved only for idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. They are being used in research studies, that is in clinical trials, for HP and for a variety of other types of pulmonary fibrosis uh, of known cause. Uh, so there may be a role for these drugs in the future, depending on the results of these research studies. Um, and uh, if you are eligible for one of these studies, I know one of these studies just closed enrollment, um, but if you are eligible for one of these studies, um, certainly talk to your doctor about whether it's right for you. Uh, we do have a clinical trial finder uh, on the Pulmonary Fibrosis Foundation website uh, where you can search for clinical trials in your neighborhood uh, or at least in your area. That's at uh, pulmonaryfibrosis.org. That's our website, and you can find our tr clinical trial finder there. So I am now going to move on, and feel free to type in questions as we go along. I'm happy to answer questions. Uh, but I am going to move to connective tissue disease-related interstitial lung disease, which is a mouthful. So I'm going to just use the abbreviation CTD, ILD. I'm going to define it and talk about it now. So CTD-ILD is, is actually a family of diseases. It's not one disease. And you, you could also think about this family of, of interstitial diseases as autoimmune in origin. 
The word autoimmune means that the body's immune system is attacking your own tissues and organs. Right? Our immune system is supposed to fight off bacteria and viruses, but sometimes the immune system, for reasons we don't completely understand, gets confused or gets mixed up. And instead of fighting off a virus, starts to fight off your own tissues and organs. So an example of an autoimmune disease is, one is lupus, which many of you may have heard of. Um, the, the full medical name for lupus is systemic lupus erythematosus, in case you've heard that, which is abbreviated SLE. Now it turns out that lupus can cause lung disease, but doesn't often cause pulmonary fibrosis. Um, but it's a good example because people have heard of it, uh, and you may know that lupus can affect the skin, it can cause a rash, lupus can affect the kidneys, um, and, and many other parts of the body. So in the case of lupus, the immune system is kind of accidentally uh, or inappropriately attacking the skin and the kidneys and other, other parts of the body. Um, and, and this attack can lead to inflammation and scarring. So that sounds a lot like pulmonary fibrosis. So in some cases, a connective tissue disease can affect the lungs and cause pulmonary fibrosis. Um, connective tissue diseases or these autoimmune diseases can also cause other lung problems like pulmonary hypertension and other things that, that we're not going to talk about. I will say there are a lot of people with these diseases, autoimmune type diseases, whose lungs are perfectly healthy. So I don't want you to think that everyone with with these diseases gets pulmonary fibrosis. And here are the major types of autoimmune diseases uh, that I'm talking about. So one very common one is rheumatoid arthritis, uh, which uh, you may know maybe even by its name, it affects the joints. So it can cause pain and swelling and stiffness and even significant damage um, to the bones and joints uh, over time. Now this disease can also affect the lungs and cause scarring in the lungs and it really can look a lot like idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. It's one of the major things that we doctors look for if someone has it, what we think is idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. We'll examine their joints and do some blood work to see if it might actually be rheumatoid arthritis. And so what's happening in that setting is the immune system is attacking the joints and it's attacking the lungs. And it, it may be more complex than that, but that's how at least we, we kind of think about it nowadays. Um, another disease that, of autoimmune origin is scleroderma. This is a disease that affects the skin, causes tightening and thickening uh, and contractures of the skin, particularly on the hands and the face. Um, it can also cause some problems with the food pipe or the esophagus. Uh, so those problems lead to reflux, um, which can be quite severe, gastroesophageal reflux or acid reflux. Scleroderma can affect the kidneys, and of course, it can affect the lungs, either by causing scarring, pulmonary fibrosis, or by causing pulmonary hypertension, or both. Uh, and I certainly see plenty of scleroderma in my own practice. Uh, a less common disease is called Sjogren's syndrome. This is an autoimmune disease that affects the lungs only in a small percentage of patients, but um, can really cause significant symptoms related to dryness of the eyes and dryness of the mouth. So I, I look carefully for that. I ask my patients questions about that because um, that's a clue that maybe there's this other disease, a Sjogren's autoimmune disease that might need treatment. And then the last common one, and there are others that I haven't listed here, but the last common one that I see actually with a fair bit of frequency in my practice is a family of three related diseases that all cause inflammation in muscles. So it could cause muscle pain, muscle weakness, um, a real pain and tenderness and deep in, in the muscles in the arms and legs. And there, there are some long names for these conditions. They're called the antisynthetase syndrome, dermatomyositis, polymyositis. Um, that uh, your doctor might might be able to, to pick up and diagnose. And the clues are paying attention to you. So the doctor examining your joints, examining your skin, 
uh, asking you questions about your joints and skin and reflux and dryness of the eyes and dryness of the mouth. Um, and sometimes people already have a diagnosis of, say, rheumatoid arthritis, and then it's pretty obvious that that's the cause of the lung disease. Um, and sometimes um, they don't. Sometimes I'm the first doctor to identify the autoimmune disease as I'm evaluating the lung disease. We also do blood tests to look for evidence of this autoimmune problem um, that can give us a clue about, about this. So let's turn to some common questions, and I'm happy to field more questions if you type them into your screen there. Um, so the first question here is, uh, how is connective tissue disease diagnosed? Oh, boy, I see you guys asked a lot of questions, and I missed them. All right, you know what? Let me take your questions here. Hold on a sec. Um, all right, it seems like some of you are still having some sound problems. I apologize for that. Um, okay, here's some questions about autoimmune disease. Um, could you have a previous autoimmune disease, and I'm reading off the chat section now, such as ITP, and everyone, ITP stands for uh, idiopathic uh, thrombocy uh, thrombocytopenia purpura, um, which is, is a low platelet count due to an autoimmune reaction to platelets. Um, so could someone have a previous autoimmune disease such as ITP, and would that have any correlation to pulmonary fibrosis? Well, the, the, the answer is probably complex. I mean, I, no one believes that ITP causes pulmonary fibrosis um, at least meaning doctors, um, but, you know, sometimes there are autoimmune clues. So maybe it is that someone had ITP or someone has thyroid disease. Some of the thyroid diseases are autoimmune, and, and, and I know a lot of you have thyroid disease. A lot of my patients do. Um, uh, or a family member had, uh, say, type 1 diabetes or ITP. You know, those aren't, those aren't telling me that you have an autoimmune disease, even if it's you with the ITP. It's not telling me that you have an autoimmune disease causing your, your lung disease, but it does mean I'm going to look really, really carefully for it, and I'm, I'm going to be very suspicious that some autoimmune feature is playing a role. Um, there's another question here, which is, does rheumatoid arthritis always show up in blood tests? And the answer is no, and that we have seen people who have rheumatoid arthritis that is documented very clearly um, by a rheumatologist, I'm going to mention them on this slide here, but by a rheumatologist um, and often by x-rays or ultrasounds of the hands that show clear evidence of joint disease with changes to the bones um, and their blood work, blood tests can be normal, uh, that is negative. So it, it does not always show up. Most people will have some clue on their blood work, some abnormality on the blood work. Um, so if there's a strong suspicion for it, even if the blood work is negative, it's reasonable to see a rheumatologist um, to, for guidance on that. Um, and another question is, is Sjogren's tested for in blood work? And the answer is it definitely can be. Uh, not all doctors will always test for Sjogren's in everyone with pulmonary fibrosis, um, but there are definitely blood tests for it, and I typically do it in my practice. Um, so I have another question here, which is my husband had IPF, and his mother and two brothers all had COPD and emphysema. Could it be that, though, that his mother and two brothers had IPF and didn't know it? And the answer is that it is possible, and, and certainly there are quite a few folks that I've seen where their IPF was misdiagnosed as COPD for a little bit. That's very common. Um, I would say probably over three-quarters of the people I see were initially diagnosed with something else causing their sim symptoms and then turned out to be pulmonary fibrosis. Um, so it is, it is possible, yeah. Uh, and actually, when I'm asking my patients about their family, uh, I ask them if anyone had COPD or emphysema. And if someone says, well, my aunt had you know, COPD and she never smoked, um, to me that suggests you can get COPD if you never smoked, but it makes me think maybe that person had pulmonary fibrosis. Um, and I, I do want to acknowledge everyone who's commenting on, on, on their situation as someone with thyroid disease, um, someone else who had mold exposure, humidifiers. Um, so certainly these are things you, I, I, I'm very happy you're sharing because I, I like having this kind of conversation. 
Um, uh, so thank you for that. So another question here is, my mother had dermatomyositis, if everyone remembers, I mentioned that on the previous slide. Uh, could that have something to do with my diagnosis of IPF? So I would say that you, you should talk to your doctor about that, Scott. Um, it is possible, but really only your doctor can, can tease out whether an autoimmune problem is contributing to your disease. And you also have autoimmune hemolytic anemia with ITP. So that's, a, that's an, another autoimmune, obviously, disease based on its name there. So I can't give you a diagnosis or make any recommendations other than you should certainly, you know, see your doctor and bring this up as a possibility. Um, I'm going to mention treatment. Uh, someone has a question here about treatment, so I'm going to mention that on the next slide. Hashimoto's contribute to IPF? That's a great question uh, from Kelly. The, the answer is, um, is we don't know, but there are two research studies out there that are intriguing. One is that, uh, and I observed this in my own practice even before this paper came out, I think a lot of people did, but putting it out in a research medical publication was very helpful. Um, really fantastic uh, researchers, um, Justin Oldham and Imri Noth, uh, one of whom's in Chicago, one of whom's at UC Davis. And what they found is that they had a lot of patients with pulmonary fibrosis and thyroid disease. And so they wonder if that's an autoimmune link. Um, they, 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 we don't know what the link is, but they, they, we see them a lot together. Um, and the other paper that came out was a, a paper that was a science, scientific paper, so it didn't involve people. Um, but it was a study um, that I believe came out of Yale University uh, in Naftali Kaminsky's group there. Uh, and looked at um, the role of thyroid hormones, the, the, you know, the hormones that your thyroid uh, gland makes, uh, and they seem to be involved in, in protection of pulmonary fibrosis. So I think there's a story there that, that really has not yet been um, completely uh, fleshed out. So there's probably more to come about the role of th the interaction between thyroid and lung disease. Uh, it's fascinating to me. So I have another question here, which is, I'm the, the one allergic to mold. We use humidifiers in the cold months, and the mold grows grows in my flower beds. I also had ITP. Uh, is this same? You have a lot of ITP on the call. It's okay. Um, I also had ITP and was diagnosed with IPF in July of 2017, and thyroid disease. Wow. So Kathy, you 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 have all the pieces that we've been talking about. Well, um, certainly. You know, I, I, again, I, I can't give you a diagnosis or, or do a consult over the Internet, but you can, I do recommend that you talk to your doctor about whether the mold is a problem, whether, you know, ITP, again, is not a cause, but is that a sign that there might be an autoimmune disease? So, you know, certainly bring it up with your doctor. Your doctor should fairly easy, easily be able to sort it out. Um, uh, and if not, you can always uh, seek an opinion at a pulmonary fibrosis care center. You can find a list of those centers on our, on our website at pulmonaryfibrosis.org. So we have another question. I have MCTD, and that everyone stands for mixed connective tissue disease. And my son, who's 46, has, six, has celiac disease. Is he susceptible to pulmonary fibrosis? Um, I, I would not, I don't know if I'm able to answer that question. I mean, everyone is susceptible. Is he at increased risk? I, I really don't know. I'm assuming you have pulmonary fibrosis, uh, Rosalind, uh, along with the MCTD. Uh, I mean, I, I don't. I wouldn't think he's at increased risk. You know, it's not something I would tell him to stay, you know, lose sleep about. Um, so I, again, it's hard for me to answer for a specific person, but in general, I'd say no. Uh, can you have a diagnosis of multiple autoimmune diseases? And the answer is yes, at least that we see people who have features of different ones. Doctors, rheumatologists I work with will often use the word overlap syndrome to describe people who have features of different autoimmune diseases. Oh, I see, Rosalind, you did say uh, PF, yeah. Um, all right, and Kathy, thanks for sharing that. Let me see. So feel free, people, to type. I like, I like that. So feel free to type in questions. I'll, I'll try to answer best I can. I, I know I qualify a lot of the things I say. I apologize for that. So um, I'll move back to my slide for now. So how is CTD or autoimmune disease diagnosed? So generally a rheumatologist uh, is involved. This is a, a specialist in autoimmune diseases. They also specialize in joint diseases. 
Um, they get involved to help diagnose autoimmune diseases, so I often have patients who I'll refer to a rheumatologist or a rheumatologist will see a patient who has an autoimmune disease and is found to have lung disease, so they get sent to me. Um, and it's really based on the symptoms you have. A rheumatologist will examine your joints and your skin uh, and do some blood tests. Sometimes they'll do x-rays or, or even more invasive tests like a biopsy to try to sort things out. Um, so if, there's, if your doctor does suspect it or if you're worried about it, see a rheumatologist. Um, uh, so this is a common question I get, which is I have an autoimmune disease. It could be rheumatoid arthritis. It could be scleroderma. And then they say, then the question is, can I also have idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis? So we know you can have pulmonary fibrosis, but I, could I have this very specific disease, IPF, that I mentioned at the very beginning of the talk? And generally, the answer is no. That is, if you have pulmonary fibrosis and you have scleroderma, most of us would say you cannot carry a diagnosis of IPF. Now, could, because you can have PF, you have CTDILD, as it says on the top of the slide, but not IPF. Now, there are some people who have an autoimmune disease where the disease is entirely inconsistent with the lung disease. That is, there's a major mismatch between what we see on a CAT scan or on a biopsy uh, and what we, what we see in terms of the autoimmune disease that that person has. So generally the answer is no, but there are going to be some people where they do end up with an appropriate diagnosis of, of IPF. I'm sorry if that's confusing, but... So treatment, there was a question in the chat box about treatment. Uh, how are these diseases treated? And the answer is that they're very different, um, depending on the autoimmune disease. Um, when someone has an autoimmune disease, I have to work with their rheumatologist to come up with the, the treatment plan. Because sometimes, and this is at the bottom of the slide, sometimes there's a treatment for their disease, that is, the, sorry, their autoimmune disease, that might be different than the treatment for the lung disease. So sometimes the rheumatologist puts them on one drug and I say, great, can I add on this other drug to treat the lungs? And then you might be on two drugs. And in other cases, there might be a single drug that can treat the autoimmune disease and treat the lung disease altogether. So it really depends on the type of autoimmune disease um, that you have, if you have one, uh, and um, and a lot of other features about, about you and the details. You know, sometimes we won't treat with medication because the risks may be bigger than the benefits. I do want to mention uh, stem cell transplantation for scleroderma, um, which is also called systemic sclerosis. Um, there have been a few research studies published, including one very recently, doing stem cell transplant. And that's, that's also called a bone marrow transplant. Um, although in this, it's a little, it's a little different than what typical bone marrow transplant, but it's the same idea um, where we take actually your own. We don't get it from someone else. We use your own stem cells uh, from your blood and um, use them, get rid of your immune system, and then give you back your stem cells to regrow a healthy immune system. Um, and that has been effective for some people with scleroderma and interstitial lung disease. Uh, so you know, if you do have scleroderma. Most people will not be eligible because of many, many different reasons. Um, but if you have scleroderma, particularly with lung disease, you can certainly talk to your, your rheumatologist and your pulmonologist about whether that's appropriate for you. Um, and it, it has helped some people quite dramatically. Now, I want to emphasize that these stem cell transplants, which are a very intense medical intervention, are completely different from quote unquote stem cell therapies that you might find on the internet um, which uh, uh, for which there's no evidence that they work and they can be very expensive. Uh, the FDA in the United States has issued a warning about these stem cell therapies um, and the Pulmonary Fibrosis Foundation has also put out a white paper uh, a couple years ago that you can find on our website um, advising people on on these these therapies. Sorry, let me find the next slide. Uh, okay, so can profanidone, which is aspirate, or nintanidib, which is OFEB, be used to treat a CTD-ILD? So currently, as I said, for HP, 
Um, these two drugs are only approved by the FDA and, and approved in Europe and Canada and other places only to treat idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. Now, having said that, um, there's a lot of interest in this idea, and there are trials, some of which have been completed, but we don't know the results, and others that are still ongoing to see if one or the other might be helpful. Um, there's one study of profanidone in scleroderma patients who have pulmonary fibrosis. It was a small study. It's been published. Um, there was no placebo group. I, I think you're probably all familiar with the word placebo. That means a group that doesn't get the treatment. So it's a little hard to know if it was helpful, but um, a lot more data to come. And my hope is that we get some data, you know, clinical trial results that um, that might help us expand the indications for therapy. But currently, for example, in my practice, I don't use these treatments uh, for people with autoimmune disease. And the last common question I get uh, is can lung transplantation be used if I have connective tissue disease, ILD? Um, and a specific question I heard was I have scleroderma and I was turned down for transplantation. So I'll say a few things. So one is that there are, I don't know, at least 60 lung transplant centers in the United States and, and plenty outside the United States. And each transplant center has a different protocol and plan and criterion for handling this. So there's no one right answer. Now, having said that, there are plenty of people with autoimmune disease that have received a lung transplant. Um, if you look at United States transplant registry data, which is available online at the SRTR or OPTN websites, you'll find plenty of people, you know, hundreds, hundreds and hundreds of people with autoimmune disease who've had a lung transplant. Um, Scleroderma can be a concern for people with, um, or can be a concern on the part of the transplant doctors and surgeons because scleroderma in particular can affect the esophagus and cause severe reflux, which transplant doctors worry about a lot because reflux might worsen lungs after a, trans a transplant. Scleroderma can also affect the kidneys, and, and people with poor kidney function may not be eligible for a transplant. But you, we can't say anything that applies to everyone because everyone is different. So the answer is, can lung transplantation be used? The answer is yes. And each transplant center is different. And if one center said no, maybe you should look at another center. Maybe a different transplant center has a completely different perspective on this. And I will say over the past few years, there have been about four research studies looking at scleroderma and transplant and most of them have said, have come to the conclusion that it's safe and that the outcomes after transplantation, lung transplantation, if you have scleroderma, are pretty much the same as everyone else. And another study suggested that the outcomes were worse. So every transplant will, will do it differently. Um, I got some feedback that the sound is, is broken up. So if other people have that same experience, please chime in and I'll see if there's something we can do about it. Um, I also received a, another question here, which is, I live in a humid environment. Would you recommend a dehumidifier or an air purifier? Um, I, that's a question that I strongly recommend that you talk to your doctor about, because it is, it is a good idea for some people, but it's not necessary for everyone. So I'm going to very briefly touch on occupational lung diseases and then the medication and radiation treatment ones. Um, as I mentioned, doctors use this, this long medical term, pneumoconiosis, um, to refer to these. These diseases are due to inhalation of particles or dust in the workplace. And most people have heard of asbestos, um, which is a fire retardant that is no longer used, but was used you know, well into the 70s. Um, and there are people who were exposed to this, who breathed in particles and developed scarring or pulmonary fibrosis from breathing in these little tiny particles. Um, many people have also heard of black lung, which is due to working in a coal mine, exposure to coal dust. Um, and again, doctors have a long medical term, coal workers, pneumoconiosis. Um, and this disease can also have some COPD and emphysema associated with it. Another example is a condition called silicosis, which is from stone grinding and particles of silica in the air. And there's a very long list. Uh, there, you know, there are many, many of these. Um, and uh, they're a little, in, at least, I know in some parts of the country, we're still seeing a lot of some of these, uh, like silicosis and, and uh, coal workers' disease. 
in my neck of the woods, in, in you know, I work in New York City, we don't see a lot of it, but we see some of it. Uh, so the clues that I look for when I'm talking to a patient is, you know, what kind of work did you do or do you do now or did you do in the past? Uh, and so, you know, we know that certain exposures for in people who were in the military, for example, shipyards back in the 70s and 60s and before, are a risk factor. Um, and if there are chemicals or other exposures in the workplace, we'll often review the materials uh, safety data sheets, um, which can sometimes give us clues about respiratory effects of certain chemicals. There are some clues on CAT scans sometimes, um, but sometimes we require a lung biopsy to be certain that it's an occupational lung disease. And treatments are individualized. Certainly avoiding the exposure is critical. Lung transplantation is available to some. Um, and then if there's inflammation in the lungs, we sometimes use immunosuppressive medications um, but often it's all scar tissue and we're left with very few treatment options. Uh, but again, talk to your doctor about whether there are specific treatments that might, might work for you. So I want to turn to medications. Uh, there are a variety of medications uh, that are um, known to cause inflammation, uh, injury, or scarring in the lungs. You, not in everyone. There are a lot of people who take these medications and their lungs are perfectly fine. Um, but some examples include uh, nitrofurantoin, uh, which has brand names such as Macrobid and Macrodamptin. It's an antibiotic. Another drug is amiodarone, uh, which is used to treat heart arrhythmias. Certainly the most well-known drug is the drugs are different forms of chemotherapy, not all chemotherapies, but some chemotherapies um, that can cause scarring and, and injury in the lungs. Methotrexate. Uh, which is used to treat certain autoimmune diseases and other conditions. And then radiation therapy to the chest. And usually we're talking about radiation therapy for Hodgkin's lymphoma or non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Uh, many years later, it's scarring in the chest. Um, but there, uh, there are other chest diseases that get radiation treatment where we can see this. Um, the treatment is often to avoid the medication, but of course do it under your doctor's guidance. Um, sometimes we will use immunosuppression and sometimes, most of the time not, but sometimes transplantation is, is indicated. Um, all right, so let me shift to the chat box. We have a question, is biopsy the gold standard for confirming a diagnosis of IPF? Um, so that, yeah, that's a good question. Um, I see someone responded saying lung biopsies are not always conclusive and that's actually perfect answer because the real gold standard is um, me and the, and the radiologist and sometimes the, the pathologist who's the doctor looking at the lung biopsy getting together and saying what do we think this is when we put all of the information together um, and currently a lot of people in the in a lot of doctors in, in in this field of pulmonary fibrosis tend to feel that the gold standard is is derived out of the communication between these experts um, about a particular patient's situation, which kind of makes sense, right? That it may not be one specific um, finding that gives us the diagnosis. It's rather all the features about your health and your condition that guide us. Um, and often we can make a diagnosis of IPF without a biopsy, but maybe about 25, 35% of the time we can't do it without the biopsy. Yeah, someone mentioned the term multidisciplinary discussion. That's exactly what I'm describing. So if you see the term multidisciplinary discussion come up on uh, inspire.com or, or anywhere else, that's exactly what I'm talking about. Um, yeah, and Kathy, your experience of it came back to, the, you had to go back to the high-res CAT scan because the biopsy wasn't enough, that situation is quite common actually, yeah. All right, so I'm going to shift, I actually only have a couple more slides, um, shift to part two which is this idea of risk factors for pulmonary fibrosis. So what is a risk factor? Uh, it's it's kind of a broad and almost a vague term. It can be used to describe anything that either is known to cause a disease or is suspected to cause a disease. So some examples of really strong risk factors are high blood pressure, which is called hypertension. So high blood pressure is a risk factor for heart disease because we think high blood pressure can cause heart disease. And we also think that treating high blood pressure can reduce your risk of heart disease. We also know that smoking, cigarette smoking, is a risk factor for lung cancer. And quitting smoking or never smoking 
can decrease your risk of lung cancer. As I mentioned earlier, mold exposure is a risk factor for hypersensitivity pneumonitis, and diabetes is a risk factor for kidney disease. Now, here's an important element about a risk factor. Usually what we mean is some of the people with the risk factor will get the disease, not everyone with the risk factor will get the disease. So it's not that everyone with hypertension gets heart disease, and it's certainly not true that everyone with diabetes gets kidney disease, and most people exposed to mold will never get hypersensitivity pneumonitis. So these are things that increase the risk of a disease. So they do cause it, but they don't cause it alone. So they're one risk factor among many. And so here's the thing that's interesting and evolving, and this is a little bit cutting edge, and I only have one slide on this. We could do a whole talk on this. But here's the thing. We're finding out that even diseases that we call idiopathic have non-genetic risk factors. And some of them may be obvious, like we know smoking is bad for the lungs, but it turns out that things like autoimmunity, even if it's not causing, say, rheumatoid arthritis or scleroderma, but just having that autoimmune signal, just as some of you were mentioning in your questions, just having some concern for autoimmunity based on your own history, your family history, your blood work, or something, might actually be contributing to diseases that we're currently calling idiopathic. Um, mold exposure that we think causes HP, well, sometimes we see people with pulmonary fibrosis that on a CAT scan or biopsy looks nothing like HP, but they do have mold exposure. And so we wonder, could the mold still be contributing to their disease? Some people think that gastroesophageal reflux, which is acid reflux, might contribute to IPF. Um, there is a, there's also a link between certain occupational exposures and IPF. There's a link between air pollution and IPF. That's very new data in the past few years. Um, and often it's traffic-related air pollution that's come up as a signal. And then my own personal theory is that sleep apnea might contribute to scarring in the lungs in some people with idiopathic disease. So there's, there's a whole evolving area of, of understanding what's actually causing IPF and other idiopathic forms of pulmonary fibrosis. Um, and one day, my hope, and I think there are other people who I know are like-minded, other doctors and scientists, will probably evolve how we think about this as moving away from idiopathic in thinking about multiple potential risk factors that could be causing their disease or your disease. Um, so I just want to sum up, and yeah, I just want to sum up here. So I mentioned four major types of pulmonary fibrosis of known cause, chronic hypersensitivity pneumonitis, connective tissue disease related interstitial lung disease, occupational lung disease, and then diseases due to medication or radiation therapies. I will tell you that in my clinical practice, about three quarters of my patients have either IPF, chronic HP, autoimmune disease, or sarcoidosis, which we didn't talk about. Um, so these first two here are actually quite common causes of pulmonary fibrosis. And then I mentioned these risk factors. They're still new and evolving ideas. I mean, other than smoking is a kind of clear one. And then I know this is a long link here at the bottom, but this link links to a website I put up and a posting I put up back in 2016 about causes of pulmonary fibrosis that you could you could refer to and, and take a look at. Um, so we're almost out of time. There were a couple other questions that came up that I put up on the screen. Uh, how important is it to isolate the cause of pulmonary fibrosis? Well, my, my sense is that if I can help figure out the cause, then maybe if we can eliminate the cause, remove the mold, treat the autoimmune disease, get you out of the workplace, or stop the medication, that, that might be really helpful to your health. Um, I can't say it's always helpful, but there are times where it is extremely helpful. Um, and you mentioned this question is about dis, uh, pulmonary fibrosis that isn't of known cause, but seems to be autoimmune in origin. That's the kind of risk factor approach. And then I can't really answer if the IPF meds are right for you. That's, I, I apologize. That's really only a question that your doctor can, can answer. Um, and, it, so, and here's an update on the clinical trial, which an intentative, which is OFEV, is being used uh, by PF scleroderma. So that's a trial of OFEV or an intentative for people with scleroderma and pulmonary fibrosis. And that trial has completed enrollment, I believe, uh, 
Um, but the people in, who are in the study are still being followed over time. So um, that means that we don't have any results yet. But the fact that it finished enrollment is a good sign that maybe, I don't know, maybe in the next year or so, maybe uh, hopefully not longer than that, that we might get a result. Um, and I think also over the next one, two, three years, we're going to see a lot of new clinical trial results come out um, for a variety of different diseases that are not IPF, but also IPF. Um, so I, I, my hope is that we get a lot more guidance um, from these clinical trials on the best way to treat, whether we should be using these what we call anti-fibrotic drugs like OFEV and, and Esprit in people with pulmonary fibrosis that's not IPF, or maybe we shouldn't be. Maybe they're, they're not effective or they're harmful. Uh, we can only know from these research studies. Um, so uh, we're ending right on the hour, which is great. I want to thank you all for attending. Um, I really appreciated all your questions. That was great. I apologize for the sound problems in the beginning. I also want to thank um, Lori uh, and Kate and Lindsay and others from PFF who uh, helped put this together, uh, as well as our sponsors, Behringer, Ingelheim, and Genentech. All right, thank you, everyone, and we'll send out um, notices about the, uh, the next webinar, which uh, should be in June.